I should be able to mute you all when we start. Oh, okay. Yes. <clears throat> Good morning, Barry. Good morning. Hey, Barry. <laughs> yep. Joe, if you need anybody, can we unmute ourselves if we need to talk? Uh, hang on one second. If not, we're going to have to all individually mute and then unmute when we want. There's a setting where you can allow people to unmute themselves. Yeah. So are we going to vote on who has best background? If so, I think Skip wins. Yeah, Skip looks like an ad for the island. <laughs> you can all do that with Zoom. It's under your settings. You can pick That's what, what Skip want. uses when he tries to sell his house. <laughs> he puts... All right, we are now streaming live. Skip, if you want to get us started, um, it's a couple minutes after nine. All right. <clears throat> well, the, the, obviously, the clearest way to get started is to start by saying thank you to all of you for taking the time to uh, go over some of these things that we want to cover today. Uh, <clears throat> we're working on our uh, uh, the part of the uh, comprehensive emergency plan that would be our pandemic response. Uh, <clears throat> I, I think our, our goal is is go over what's being called reopening. In our uh, language, I guess, in the CEP, it's really uh, the uh, part of the recovery phase that we would look at uh, for a pandemic situation. Um, Scott Cave, our consultant, will lead us through. He's got the, the agenda, which we'll work on. Uh, this meeting format with Zoom is a little bit new for, for me and for a lot of folks, I assume. Uh, we want to hear from all of you, but clearly not all at once. Uh, so uh, let's try and uh, stay on mute. And when you want to do something, either raise your hand or somehow indicate that you have a comment that you'd like to make and we'll see what we can do to get you going on that. Um, kind of what we learned in elementary school, I guess, huh? <laughs> All right. Um, yeah, Skip, if I can just interrupt for one second. Um, I'm gonna let each person individually control their own mute. Um, so if you're not talking, if you don't have a question, if you can put yourself on mute, just click the little uh, microphone button um, on the bottom of the screen. And then if you have a question, you can go ahead and um, unmute yourself uh, to ask your question. I, I also, uh, in, in doing this with other groups uh, over the past few weeks, I think if you're on mute, uh, if you just press and hold your space bar, that will temporarily take the mute off and you can say something and then release and you're back on mute again. So if that's easier. Okay, uh, let's see, with, with all of that done, uh, Scott, I'm gonna turn it over to you. Scott is not uh, showing us video <clears throat> for technical reasons, which I think only he can understand at this point. But Scott, if you will start us through, we'll be underway. Okay, thank you, Skip, and good morning, everyone pleasure to be with you all this morning. Um, if I can just make sure that, Joe, have you been keeping track of who's all in attendance? I've been trying to type in names, but I don't know if I got everyone. Does, does someone have a, a full list of names who are? I think I've got them, Scott. You've got Skip? Okay. All right. Yeah. Then we don't need to go through all the introductions then. Excellent. Well, as Skip said, uh, our goal today is to uh, talk about reopening and really focus on how we can coordinate uh, with the town and the different entities represented. Um, the, the 
the places in our plans where reopening intersect. Um, so we'll be walking through this agenda to discuss all those possible um, issues and, and areas where the plans need to coordinate with each other. Uh, before we do that, I thought it'd be helpful to just briefly um, talk through what we have looked backwards instead of looking forwards initially. Let's just look backwards for a few minutes uh, to see exactly where we um, should draw a line in the sand for, because we'll probably go through future phases of this reopening and closing again and so forth. Um, and it'd be good for us to at least have a better idea of what those triggers should be for closing again, um, should that become necessary. So let me go ahead and uh, stop sharing just for a minute. I'll share a different document here. Okay. And this is um, just the same agenda, but I had a, a full list of uh, the, the timeline, at least you know, from my perspective, um, that we went through because uh, all the pandemic plans that I think you all have been using were really based on the uh, World Health Organization and, and CDC and South Carolina uh, stages of pandemic, uh, which were not clearly announced to the public, um, like we have these OPCON changes when we go through hurricanes. Um, so therefore, I think it was difficult to understand where we were uh, in the overall pandemic as things were evolving. And it was, and it was also difficult to understand what, what actions we should be taking in response. So going forward, I think we'll have to revise those triggers for pandemic. Um, and it seems to me that the travel alerts uh, are probably the best indicator of uh, where we are in the overall pandemic and um, what should be triggered <coughs> certain actions on our part. Uh, if you look at the initial travel alerts, obviously there were some very early, um, which would probably give us an idea that we should at least be monitoring things. Uh, but right when the World Health Organization declared a global pandemic back on March 11th, uh, the CDC responded very quickly within 24 hours with this global travel alert level two. And, and there's only three levels of travel alerts. So this one was be careful if you travel internationally, uh, take precautions. And then about two weeks later, they issued their, their highest level, which was uh, avoid all unnecessary international travel at all costs. So again, I think those those levels would have um, served us pretty well. Um, they they were pretty well announced, so that most people didn't understand what they were or what they meant. Um, but they were publicly announced and um, easy to track. Uh, looking back on it now, um, and then of course our governor issued a, a stay-at-home order, you know, a few weeks after these travel alerts. But again, those travel alerts would have um, provided some important triggers for us. In, to look at you know, when to start having more serious conversations about closing public buildings and services and so forth, even before uh, the governor had issued his uh, stay-at-home order. So again, I, I don't wanna to spend too much time here, but I just wanna make note that we'll, we'll probably need to update our plans going forward um, to use these travel alerts. I don't know if uh, at some point over the summer or next few months, if we might see these travel alerts relaxed or not. Um, <clears throat> so they may not be the best indicator of uh, going with this pandemic, but certainly for new pandemics, I think those travel alerts will, will serve us well. So with that being said, let's now go ahead and, and move forward with the rest of our uh, discussion on recovery and reopening. Um, I wanna first turn our attention to the criteria, just like we were talking about the triggers for closing, uh, we really need to identify criteria or triggers for reopening. So um, let's talk about these three options. We have governor's order, which has already been um, been put into place um, and is continuing to evolve over time as certain other businesses are, are allowed to reopen. Um, Charleston County, um, you know, considering reopening public buildings. Uh, but then there are other triggers besides these governmental announcements and orders. There's also some considerations for, you know, do we have enough resources and staff and so forth uh, to support reopening, which I think are more on an individual basis. Um, but in terms of criteria for the town, let's start with the town first. Um, Mayor and Skip and other council members, uh, what do you believe are the appropriate uh, criteria for reopening town hall and, and allowing public services within town hall? <clears throat> 
Phil, I'll let you take that because I believe you're working on a reopening plan. Is that correct? Yeah, we we don't have a, um, a specific date set at this time. Um, we have been monitoring, trying to see what the state uh, and county were going to do. Um, those who are not aware, we have a, um, uh, right now we're doing three times a week, a countywide uh, conference call. So we've been in the loop with what some of the neighboring jurisdictions are, are working on and targeting. Um, several right now don't have a, a specific date. And like I said, we're, we're one of them currently. Um, the county has been um, um, putting together its plan. Uh, and they, as of yesterday, still have not announced an opening date. Um, so we've been putting some um, uh, temporary protective measures and plans in place for uh, when the time comes to reopen Town Hall. Um, so we've gone ahead, we've um, uh, installed some uh, barriers up at our front desk. Um, we've ordered some new signage. Um, anybody who's ever come to town hall, it's it's always been pretty informal. Um, somebody needs to meet with me or Linda or something like that. We walk right in and come into our office. That's not going to be the case anymore. Uh, um, we've put up a, um, a barrier at our front window um, just to minimize um, contact between people coming in the door and our staff. Um, we will be, um, once we get the okay to reopen to the public, we will be um, taking out uh, the furniture from our lobby. We'll be taking out all of our brochures, uh, magazine racks, those type things. Uh, we'll be going to, when you uh, have business to do with the town, you come in, conduct your business and you leave. Uh, sorry to disappoint everyone, but that will also mean that the um, uh, candy bowl will be going away, at least for the time uh, being. <laughs> I think just about everybody who walks in this building sticks their hand in that candy bowl. Uh, so we'll be um, putting that aside. Um, we will likely um, be limiting um, access to the building to uh, no more than either two or three uh, individuals coming in the lobby uh, at any uh, specific point in time. Um, if we have more than that, they'll have to wait outside uh, until somebody leaves the building. Um, just because our lobby is so small, it's going to be difficult to uh, practice any type of um, social distancing if you were to have a crowd uh, coming in the building at the same time. Um, we have purchased some uh, um, protective gear um, for our staff members. Uh, if they would feel mo more comfortable using it. So we have a um, supply of masks and gloves um, uh, at, uh, at their disposal. Um, we've had a little bit of a difficult time, but we've been able to get our hands on some uh, uh, hand sanitizer. So we've restocked all of our uh, dispensers here at Town Hall, um, both for our staff and for the public when they come in. Um, for the time being, um, we uh, will not be holding, um, uh, allowing the public to come in for council meetings in council chambers. Uh, most of our boards, commissions, committees will be meeting uh, electronically um, by Zoom and we'll be um, streaming those live to our um, uh, online platforms uh, like YouTube. Um, <clears throat> it'll create a, a little bit of a a challenge when you have <coughs> a um, public hearing, when the public can't come in uh, and speak about an item that's currently pending um, before council. So we um, have some plans for how we'll uh, continue to go about and um, incorporate public feedback and public uh, in those meetings. Um, uh, last check, I think council uh, is still planning to meet um, here uh, as a body in the building, as we have been doing for the last uh, two months or so. Uh, we have to separate them with the six foot um, separation, um, but uh, I, I believe, and the mayor can confirm, but I, I believe at the uh, uh, last time that was discussed, council was planning on uh, holding the meeting here um, as a body in council chambers. So uh, we, we have pretty much most of our, our 
plans and process in place. Really the only thing still outstanding is um, uh, the date when we anticipate. Uh, we'll, we'll probably do it in two phases. The first one will have our staff coming in uh, and working uh, again at Town Hall. Um, we've, even though we've been closed to the public, um, staff has been able to uh, come and go as needed. Um, so most days there's somebody in the building um, for the most part, uh, pretty much the entire day, um, picking up checks and accepting commissions and those types of things. Um, once we do get the go ahead to reopen, we'll bring our staff in first, um, kind of get everything caught up, uh, processed, and then um, uh, at least a few days, perhaps as much as a week after that, uh, we'll reopen the building uh, to the public. Uh, of course, we're going to still continue even when we do reopen. Um, we'll be encouraging people to uh, continue as, as much as possible to um, interact with us virtually. So, uh, you know, we'll still be requesting or recommending that they uh, submit plans electronically and, and those types of for the most part has been pretty seamless over the last uh, seven weeks or however long we've been going. Um, but uh, um, so that's that's basically where we stand still uh, at a little bit of a wait and see mode on dates, but um, uh, for the most part, pretty much ready to go once we get the, uh, the all clear. We would, I'm, I'm sure, love to set our own criteria for doing things, but unfortunately we have neither the resources nor the wherewithal to do anything even approaching that. So we will obviously lean very heavily on what the county is doing and what the state is doing and take take our lead from them as far as uh, the steps we're going to take for, for a reopening. I'd also say that okay. the primary consideration in all of this is that we still have essentially mandated social distancing. The governor has not uh, relaxed social, social distancing, even with his orders in respect of opening of businesses, the requirement for social distancing remains in place. So uh, for purposes of town council, so long as we have the order in place for practice of social distancing, we will not be able to have the public attend our meetings and we will be conducting our meetings, as Joe said, by Zoom. Although our last discussion about doing that, I think the majority view was that it will work just fine for members of council to come to council chambers and then our meeting can be done uh, made available to the public on youtube so until that turns out to be uh, not preferred I think we will continue to follow that practice. Of course, we haven't had a public meeting. All of our meetings have been since we canceled meetings, our, all of our meetings have been emergency meetings and the public does not have an opportunity to come in or participate in our emergency meetings. The other thing I would point out is it's, I would view it as primarily Joe's responsibility to keep an eye on staff for any signs of illness. And, you know, as we are preparing to, to allow people to come into the building to conduct business, uh, we don't have much opportunity to observe who comes through the door. I guess the, the staff can act appropriately if someone comes in and they're coughing and sneezing and appear to be ill and ask them to step outside and conduct their business as we are now doing so by telephone or email. But so far as our own staff is concerned, I think that's really Joe's responsibility to keep tabs on the, we'll just say the general health of staff. And then should anyone present with symptoms that 
uh, Joe feels they should be staying home, then he can urge them to stay home and we'll carry on with who's left. But uh, as, as we said, we're, we're being guided primarily, I would say, by what Charleston County uh, resources agencies are doing. We do interact with Charleston County Building Services on a fairly regular basis, and there are other operations of Charleston County that we deal with on a regular basis. So to the extent that we've been able to conduct business with them as needed, that's worked okay. Uh, we've been conducting business by telephone or email here at Town Hall. And as far as I know, I haven't heard Joe say that does that hasn't worked, but obviously we'd like to be able to get back to having people come in if they feel that that's something they need to do. It's more uh, convenient for them to bring things here rather than try to do it by email. That's all fine, but I think we're really taking our we our, our guidance, I guess, by what Charleston County is doing. As Joe said, we're participating in Charleston County Emergency Management Department conference calls three days a week. And they had been informing the participants of that call that they were working on their plans to open, get open to the public, but they have not set a date for that yet. If we decide that, if Joe decides, I, I'll say, I think it's primarily in his domain that we're ready to open and we decide that we want to, he decides that we would like to be open before Charleston County. I see no reason why we can't do that, but we do not yet at present have a date set to reopen for the public. Thank you all. And, and really what I'd like to focus on right now is um, what what are those triggers for reopening town hall to the public? Do you think you're going to tie it to uh, Charleston County? Once Charleston County opens their building to the public, will that be the trigger uh, you think for town hall to reopen to the public, at least in limited fashion, as you've described? I, I don't. I don't see us opening any later than the county opens. Um, there's, as the mayor said, there's a, a possibility we may open um, before the county does, but I, I don't see it being after. Um, really, the the two, I would say, most important items for us to take into consideration are, uh, number one, the uh, demographics of the community um, tending to skew more towards a um, uh, I think our median age is about 65 to 67. Um, so we, we tend to have, uh, at least from what the medical experts are telling us, a, a, a cohort of individuals who may be more uh, at risk um, from the virus. Um, <clears throat> and that would be a, um, you know, something to consider. Do we want people coming into town hall where they're gonna be interacting with uh, contractors and others um, who, you know, may be coming in from outside the area. Uh, and then also the, um, uh, the, the safety of our um, staff as well. So um, I, I, would, I would venture to guess we're, we're probably going to be at least a week or more out. Um, but we'll, we'll wait and see the last week or so, the county keeps saying, you know, they're still working on their plan. They haven't um, set a date yet. Um, if that seems like it's gonna continue, we may just go ahead and, and schedule our own uh, anticipated date, which uh, I believe Kiowa uh, has done already. Um, but uh, that, that's really the, the, the items that we're gonna take into, uh, uh, highest consideration, the safety of our staff, the safety of our residents, uh, and um, uh, to to an extent, what the county's plans are. Okay. 
And then um, I guess the second phase of reopening town hall, which would be getting back to sort of normal operations, right? Removing all the <clears throat> social distancing precautions and so forth, that would be tied to the governor's order to remove uh, social distancing statewide. Do you agree that that would likely be the trigger to resume normal operations at town hall? Yeah, I, I don't see, a, and, and, you know, with full normal operations, we're talking, you know, people can come in without restriction, uh, reopening our uh, meetings, council meetings, board commission meetings back open to the public. Um, I would say that right now is still on hold indefinitely, uh, and we will be taking our cue from uh, from the state, what the governor does, what DHEC recommending, what CDC are recommending. Uh, at least from anything we've seen and heard, it doesn't appear that uh, anything is, is on the immediate horizon in any way, shape or form uh, for when those um, social distancing recommendations are expected to, uh, to go away. Right, okay. Thank you very much. So now that we've heard the town perspective, let's uh, let's see how that might help uh, in any way inform the other entities. I don't know if you all are taking cues from the town or if you're following your own guidelines, but uh, let's start with the POA. Uh, what triggers are you all using to reopen um, if, if they haven't already reopened Lake House and other amenities? Okay, uh, just a couple of things. First of all, Scott, uh, going back to uh, what all preceded this and so on. I just wanted to say, while everyone's around this so-called virtual table, uh, we've had a great level of cooperation with the town and the club during this whole thing. Whenever we've uh, needed to get together virtually and so on, uh, we've been able to call meetings, discuss issues, the issues that were on, uh, that needed to be discussed. And I think we've all uh, have shared the information with one another that has been appropriate at the time. And uh, I'd like to thank everybody here who did that because I think that has been one of the uh, reasons why, and I'd better knock on wood when I say this, this emergency has proceeded as smoothly as it has. So you can add that level of cooperation, Scott, to your notes for what has happened beforehand. Um, just to give you an idea, any of you who have worked with Heather before know, this is our plan right now. I'm not gonna, there's about, what do you say there, Heather, about 10 pages, phase one and phase two of our different uh, ideas for opening up and so on. Heather is, and her staff have done an outstanding job of putting that together, and that's what we're uh, reviewing right now. So I know Heather is anxious to uh, share some of the details with everyone, so I'll let her go from here. Anxious isn't the word. Um, so we've, we've been kind of guessing you know our, our best educated guess on when we could possibly reopen and i think you know echoing joe's comments we're kind of just in a wait and see mode and i, I did notice that the town of kiowa said that they're going to open on may 18th um so we're looking at let's say for for our office limited contact one person at a time um, we're actually reconfiguring our front doors so that when people come in the door, they're not breathing down the face of the receptionist. Um, so we're trying to, to be prudent. Um, the lake house um, is part of the lake house, the fitness and the, well, the pool is under the auspices of DHEC and DHEC has not allowed public pools to open. We're considered a public pool. So the timing of that and the, um, restrictions, if any, around us opening would be determined by them. So that would include how many people might be able to be on the pool deck, how many people can be in the pool. We're working on a, a reservation system so that we can kind of monitor whether people are, um, if we have time limits, whether people are overstaying their limit or um, there are too many people there. So we're kind of working on that right now. It's hard to find, I'm kind of looking for an open table 
software that we can use to do our own reservations and I haven't found one yet. Um, so we're, those are the kinds of things that we're considering. The timing that we put it into two phases with a third one to be determined, um, depending on what the restrictions about distancing are and how many people can be in a facility based on the, the current calculation of five, maximum five people per thousand square feet. So we've calculated the occupancy for every room at the lake house. And when we open certain areas, we'll know how many people can be in a room at a time. Um, what I'm hearing though from people, as much as they would all love to get back to normal, I'm hearing a lot of concerns about possible uh, regrowth of the, of the virus. Um, people aren't, people are being very cautious. And I'm trying to take that into account when we talk about reopening. Um, you know, our, our owners are very concerned about their risk. So I'm not, as much as we'd like to get back to normal fast, I'm kind of, I'm inclined to keep it kind of slow and do it in a very measured way that, that works best for our, our owners. Okay, thank you, Heather. So I guess the question I have is, um, do you feel like you will be in some sense following the town's lead when the town decides to reopen town hall, will that likely trigger some uh, level of activity on, on your part or are you going to make it, that decision independently? I would like it to be coordinated, but I guess we'd have to figure out what that time is. When, when it happens, then we'll know for sure. But it would be nice if we could all essentially reopen at the same time. Okay. Yeah, was, all uh, right, so having some Oh. Yeah, go ahead, Dan. Sorry, just one thing. You know, we may open our offices in similar times or whatever, but again, the configuration, the uh, amount of space is going to dictate a lot of, of this and how and when we open. And we're looking at uh, a gym. Uh, gyms are still closed by the, uh, by the governor. Um, when he releases that and changes that and allows gyms to be open, and as Heather said, when DHEC allows pools to be open, that's probably more uh, of what will trigger our movement to that next step or our first phase that has been outlined. And uh, first phase, if, if and when you ever see our, uh, and not that we're, we're still reviewing it, that's what I'm saying, uh, when you see or is very tight uh, because as Heather noted, uh, one of the things that's built into this is suppose one of our um, workers at the gym comes down with, I mean, we, we need to shut down like right away. Suppose a couple of users of the gym come down with, um, you know, the virus or whatever, we need to shut down the gym right away. So there is opening triggers and closing triggers in this that we are very cognizant of, so. Okay, excellent, thank you. Uh, any Anyone have any other questions for the, the POA? I don't have a question per se, but uh, I, I think about the lake house, I was, I'm going to try to see whether the governor's order that had uh, essentially closed businesses had a specific provision for libraries. Of course, the lake house has a library. You have furnishings in there, places for people to sit. But the other concern to me about a library is you know, people are going to be pulling things off the shelves and putting them back on the shelves. You may have magazines placed around. And so the question then becomes, no matter what cleaning precautions you undertake, can you really allow people to use that library? The, li the library is completely closed through phase one. Um, we can't, it, there's just too much and it's too small, too much touching and all that, you're right. Um, so our phase one plan doesn't have it open at all. 
our phase two plan limits it to two people at a time and with and for very short periods of time um, with cleaning afterwards and that we're still looking at we may just keep it closed for a while a while longer I, yeah, I'm not okay. thinking so much about the social distancing challenge in that space, mm -hmm. but obviously we're still, I guess, uh, we're not confident that we know people that don't present or are asymptomatic, if you prefer, may still be shedding virus. And then the, the difficulty comes that it's not, you have no way of knowing what things have been removed and replaced from shelves or what other things in that space have been handled where a person may have left the dreaded droplets behind. That's right. Heather, just so I can uh, make sure I understand uh, clearly, can you just um, summarize uh, what, what exactly happens in your phase one, two, and three of reopening? Don't need all the details, but just sort of at yeah. a, a high level. Yeah, phase one, we I have generally at a two week period. Again, all these times are, are fluid, um, but pretty much if the if you if you're thinking of the lake house specifically, the whole left side of the building is closed. Um, we're trying to limit activity in the building, um, limited access to the lobby and fitness center. Um, and then in phase two, we would open it up a little bit more, but still no locker rooms, no bathroom, uh, things like that where people would, would gather. Um, so we're just trying to be extra careful. For the admin office, it would be pretty much the same, um, that we would have very, very limited hours. And for phase one, the, we basically operate by appointment only um, and still keep doing what we're doing with the electronic communications. Same with um, board meetings. Uh, we don't see those happening in person anytime soon. Um, phase two still keeps the board meetings virtual, um, but just allows a little more interaction between people. We would keep the, um, the playground, the basketball court, any the volleyball, those would all be closed for phase one and might open in phase two probably not the playground. I think the playground we have closed through phases one and two because it would be too difficult to know who to clean it actually be after each use. And phase three is kind of, that's our wait and see how this is going. We don't have enough information on the effects of the loosening of the regulations to see if there's any sort of resurgence of the virus. So we, we wanted to keep that open and just see where we are. And just to add to that, uh, Heather's plan that she's proposed also um, has uh, information about the use of the community center, both the pool and the meeting area and similar uh, guidelines. I don't know, Heather, does that remain closed in phase one? I'm not. I yeah, don't know. The, you know, the community center building is closed in phase one. The pool has very limited opening. Um, similarly in phase two. Um, and then we had to address uh, things like the um, garden plots and the recycling area and the maintenance area and the gate and the security vehicles. So there's a lot of, lot of moving parts in this that we're just trying to protect our employees and the public as much as we can. And we're entering into rental season, which is gonna be a challenge if people, if only, let's say only 10 people can use the pool at a time, and we have 1,200 rental guests on a Saturday. Um, I can I can see some flaring tempers. Um, so we're just going to have to try to deal with that. Thank you, Heather. And then the the triggers between uh, the different phases. Do you have those defined, or are those um, somewhat loose at this point? Just sort of depending on conditions. Yeah, they're 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 loose right now. We we did a an estimate of a two week period for each one, but we really just have to see what what the, what the governor says and how the statistics are looking before we move from one phase to the other. Right. Okay. <clears throat> All right. So um, at best right now, it would be um, 
the best case would be to coordinate phase one with the town um, reopening town hall in limited capacity, correct? Is that sort of our best case at this point? Yeah, that's what I'm thinking. Yeah, okay, very good. Well, thank you for that. Let's move on to the club. I don't know if we have Caleb or someone else from the club on the call. Yep, I'm here, Scott. Okay, hey, Caleb. Uh, can you describe your plan to reopen and, and what triggers you all are, are planning to use? Sure, we have um, a, a probably very similar phased approach to to what the what the POA is using. Um, kind of have it broken down based upon short descriptions of what these phases look and feel like, and then um, what sort of government restrictions or regulations are associated with with each phase. Um, right now, our current plan. Um, with the, that we just emailed out <clears throat> last night, I believe, is that the Pelican's Nest is opening May 15th. Uh, pools obviously will continue to remain closed. Um, Seabrook Shop will open on May 15th as well, but we're going to continue to be, to be conservative in our approach and um, continue to operate um, golf and tennis as it currently is under restrictions, not opening locker rooms, locker room lounges. Equestrian is gonna remain closed uh, a little bit longer as well because of some sharing of equipment issues and um, close contact, at least for trail rides. Boarding is, is, is fine and lessons are fine. Um, so essentially, yeah, we have it broken down into three phases, phase one, two, and three. Um, each one described, and then we have a list of, of the um, amenities and services and what happens with each with each one of those. Um, <clears throat> with this, we're currently in phase one, shifts to phase two. And again, we have some predictive, uh, predictive some timelines as well. So essentially phase one takes us through the end of, of May uh, with some things starting to open mid-May, late May. And then phase two takes us through the month of June and phase three incorporates July and August. Um, and then, you know, some degree of assumption that by September, um, things will be a little more normal, certainly much more normal than they have been the past eight weeks and what they are today. Uh, so our, our phase plan right now is really focused on getting us through the next uh, three, four months at, at this point. Okay, excellent. Thank you. Um, it doesn't sound like that uh, any of your phases uh, at this point are dependent upon the town or coordinated with the town, which is fine. I'm just clarifying that. Um, that's accurate. Yeah, I mean, a lot of our phases, you know, they're 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 dependent upon, um, you know, the way I describe it. I'll just kind of read phase one <clears throat> description to you. So, essential businesses continue to operate and select retail allowed to open under capacity restrictions, social distancing of six feet required, gatherings limited, to, um, employees encouraged to telework, hypersensitive to sanitation, social distancing enforcements, employee temperature check. So it goes on with, with descriptions like that. Phase two is when we see things um, begin to get lifted. Um, so it doesn't necessarily say town, but it's certainly in here. It's really contingent upon um, both state and town regulations. And th those are really the, the key drivers of what phase we are in. Yeah, yep, makes sense. Okay, thank you. Any questions from anyone else for Caleb and the club? Again, I don't have a question per se, but I, I do want to make it clear that the, the town has, I've issued orders that mirror and, and track what the governor's orders have done as far as uh, relaxation of the closure of businesses. So to the extent that the governor changes uh, his orders in respect of closure of businesses, that will wind up being reflected in my orders that are directed more particularly to the town. 
clearly the governor's orders control. So whenever there is a gap from the time the governor has issued an order that changes how businesses are being handled under his uh, direction, uh, that order controls for our local businesses. And th the main impact of orders that I issue is to allow our code enforcement officers to enforce my orders that would affect businesses within the town. So it's a long way of saying, essentially the controlling factor for how businesses open the ongoing requirements for social distances for businesses and so forth all come from the governor. Thank you, John. Anyone else have uh, any other comments for the club? Yeah, no, Scott, yes. Uh, as, I, as I said earlier on the call, none of us has the resources of the wherewithal <clears throat> to do any kind of reopening criteria that's data driven. I mean, as John just said, we really have to follow the, the, the governor's lead. And I believe I sent out yesterday or the day before a link to uh, the uh, website being uh, maintained by uh, the governor's office, accelerate.sc.gov. Uh, and uh, you can go into that site and really get a, a wealth of information about what they will be establishing as criteria for opening restaurants, golf courses, uh, hotels, uh, retailers, et cetera, et cetera, which might give us a lot of insight into what we think that that uh, direction and guidance is going to be from uh, from Columbia. <clears throat> Scott, this is Jerry, and I I guess this question is kind of for Caleb. We've raised it a little bit in town council, and depending on the social distancing requirements and the guessing game we play with what the governor's going to do, at what point do we pull the trigger on the July Fourth fireworks? Where does that fit into the phases of the club and you know at some point the town the town pays for the fireworks at what point do we pull the trigger on on not doing the setup and paying the rest of the contract so i i think that's an issue that's floating around out there because obviously we can't practice social distancing with with what happens on the fourth yeah, that's a great question, Jerry, and I don't really have an answer for that. I don't, I owe Joe a, a return phone call. He left me a voicemail yesterday, um, and uh, so Joe, I'll give you a call back, but but I believe Joe's voicemail was he wanted to chat with me about, about the fireworks event. Um, you know, I'm not really sure. I think that when I look at our phases that, that again, that I put together based on some wording that other clubs have, have used, um, you know, by July, there's a good chance that the <clears throat> that the large, well, I'm not saying good chance, but one of the assumptions, if you will, that I'm that I'm making, these are pretty strong assumptions, I suppose, but you have to do something to in, at least make an initial plan. But one of the things that um, is described in the phase would be large gatherings, and and at that point, the the wording from those in the club community is, is that by by July. Um, any restrictions or strong concerns on large gatherings is mainly focused on, on groups of in the tens of thousands, such as concerts and festivals and, and things like that. Um, so with, with the fireworks uh, event, this is me just kind of just talking off the cuff. I mean, I, I, I would guess it's probably in the neighborhood of 1,500 to 2,000 people um, spread, spread out over a pretty large area. So um, I would think that we would be allowed to do it. It just depends upon do we want to do it or a lot of people going to attend. Um, like Heather, I'm, I'm hearing more concerns as well from folks that, you know, that say, yeah, it's great that the nest is going to be open on May 15th, but I still don't think I'm going to go. Uh, we're also expecting for people to show up. They see the crowds, even though we will certainly do our best to, to enforce um, social distancing. We have to assume that there are going to be some crowds there. Uh, and they're going to, you know, basically say yikes, and they're going to turn around and go home. 
because they're just not prepared for that or they're going to be a little a little worried about that. Um, so as far as the fireworks event, not sure. Uh, Joe and I are going to uh, talk about it at, at some point soon. Um, it kind of depends upon if the time feels right to take a year off. Um, we, we can certainly do that, but I think from a um, point of view of just looking at the numbers, we could probably still do it because again, it's, it's a pretty large area of land that folks are spread out from under. We'd have to make some adjustments, but that, that, those are, that's my rambling on that, on that topic, Jerry. Yes. Oh, thank, you. thank you. I just think it's one of those things we can't wait to July 1st to make the decision. We kind of need to Oh no! I, yeah, no, I totally agree. I think we, we probably need to make that decision. So, you know, Brian and I are, are looking at different golf tournaments and outings and things like that. And so we're looking at things in, in kind of a 60 day window. It's kind of a rolling 60 day window. I think once you get inside 60 days, you can probably make a decent decision if, if, if you if you need to decide that far out. Um, and we're, you know, we're pretty much at that 60 day window for, for the fireworks. So uh, I, I I would suspect that we would definitely need to make a decision by the 1st of June. That's just kind of my thought right now. Um, but if we need to do it later, I'm not sure how that works with booking the, the uh, pyrotechnic, you know, folks. Um, we have a lot of flexibility here at the club. It's more about how the bookings of fireworks work and how far out you're allowed to, to uh, um, cancel. So yeah. as long as it's on the radar screen, you and Joe, I have confidence you guys will have a good conversation, but I just wanted to make sure it was on everybody's radar screen. Yeah, absolutely. So this is Deb Lehman, and from a safety standpoint, I think you need to include the fire chief and the sheriff's office in the discussion on fireworks because they provide services during your fireworks. So would you please get input from them before you make a final decision? Yeah, good thoughts. I agree. Yeah, I, I think, and the good news is that, you know, all these type of issues, whether it's fireworks or anything else, um, you know, Seabrook is not operating in, in a vacuum here, right? I mean, these are the same issues that are being discussed in many other neighboring communities and municipalities. Um, so uh, I think we'll start to see some guidance, whether that comes from the county, the governor's office, or even, you know, other governmental authorities. Uh, as we get, as Caleb said, as we get closer, you know, probably to June 1st, you'll start to see a lot of discussion regionally and maybe even statewide about uh, fireworks. Yeah, I've been watching online and I see a lot of, um, <clears throat> a lot of communities have already started um, uh, canceling theirs. Um, we'll, we'll plan to look out uh, and reach out to um, some of the jurisdictions around us to see what um, their plans are in terms of not only fireworks, but um, all, all different types of events. Um, and <clears throat> I, I think Deb's point is a good point. Um, I was wanting to uh, reach out to Caleb first just to see, you know, do we think it's even feasible understanding there's still a lot of other um, partners that would need to be brought into the fray, but um, just on the front end, if we decided, you know, even, even if we we could make it work with all of our uh, uh, entities that help put on that event. If, if we felt that um, we couldn't safely handle that type crowd, um, then we would just make the decision. We're not even going to, uh, you know, go through those other uh, steps in the process because we, you know, if, if we come to that conclusion, it's really a moot point. Um, I did just want to throw out, because I know a, a lot of you participating on the call today, um, do attend Disaster Awareness Day. Um, we have received confirmation uh, from the town of Kiowa, uh, who was scheduled to host that this year, uh, that Disaster Awareness Day has been canceled. Um, so that's something we'll be looking at again for uh, 2021. Um, but uh, in regards to the fireworks, obviously we'll have the, uh, the safety um, component and everything too, but one of the other items we'll be looking at, and I, I know that's really not the, the focus of the uh, conversation today, but one I'm sure we're all dealing with is the um, uh, financial impact um, of the um, pandemic. Um, obviously with um, people not traveling, with um, having the temporary restrictions on, on short-term rentals, that's going to have a, um, a significant impact on the 
revenue side for the town too. Uh, of course, we, we fund the fireworks display out of uh, accommodations tax, which is generated by people who come and uh, stay at rental units on the island. So that's uh, uh, an item we would take into consideration as well, but um, I, I won't get deep into that. That's a uh, discussion we'll be having with council and uh, in the coming weeks, but um, I'm sure that's something that all of us are are dealing with on the um, uh, on the financial side. This is Jerry. So Very I'm, good. I'm going to change the subject just real quickly. Um, another question for Caleb. Heather mentioned that DHEC considers the lake house pool a public pool. Caleb, how does does DHEC look at the the beach club as a public pool? Yes, absolutely, they do. Okay, so you'd be under the same restrictions and and um, whatever the governor says. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, I, I believe the state um, will differentiate between a private pool, which is something you might have in your own backyard, whereas a public pool, not necessarily open to the uh, the general public, but is like a commercial type pool or, um, you know, an apartment complex or um, an amenity, those type things, even though they're not necessarily um, in some instances truly commercial. Uh, my understanding is that the um, uh, governor's orders um, basically differentiates uh, pools that are not like in somebody's backyard. Yeah, the, the DHEC um, definition of a public pool is any pool that isn't solely for use by a single residence or for use by a duplex. Everything else is considered public. Thanks, Heather. Sure. Hey, this is, uh, this is Steve. And there's just uh, a couple of things I want to mention if I can. Uh, number one, I'm, I'm still concerned about short-term renters coming in from uh, Northern states, in particular, New York, New Jersey, et cetera, Connecticut. Uh, you know, we're, we're in kind of a protected area here and we've had a lot of visitors, but they've been maintaining uh, distance and, and that works pretty well. I don't know if that's going to happen during the summer. Uh, second thing is, I, uh, this may be extreme, but I'm almost suggesting that uh, renters should not be allowed to have amenity cards, which would control their access to the lake house if it opens and to pools, et cetera. So again, I, I'm, uh, these are just my thoughts. The last thing is, and the most important is, um, nobody's talking about what's going to trigger a close down again in the fall if we have a resurgence, which a lot of people are expecting. Uh, are, are we gonna wait for the for the, uh, for the governor to say, we got to close everything down, or are we going to be preemptive and watch? Uh, and when the, uh, when the number of virus cases go up again, uh, are we just going to close down ourselves, or, or are we going to just ride it out and wait for someone to tell us to do that? Okay, that's all I have, I've got. So Steve, uh, this is Scott. Um, you bring up good points and good questions, and I appreciate them. Uh, all of them are uh, will be addressed later in the agenda, if you just don't mind uh, holding those thoughts for a few minutes um, so we can continue to follow the agenda. And then we are going to discuss how to prepare for the next wave of, of illness and re -clo you know, closing again and all those different considerations. Um, you know, as well as the impact on short-term renters and so forth. So we'll, we'll get to that in due time. Uh, but if you don't mind, I'm going to try to stick to the agenda so we make sure we uh, stay on track here. Thank you. All right, let's move on to, I think we have Ned Collins here from uh, camp. Ned, do you mind talking um, briefly about your reopening plans? And again, if there are any um, coordinating points or triggers uh, that, that um, connect with the town? Sure. Um, good morning, everyone. We, if you don't know, we are closed entirely except for our staff who are still here cleaning and getting ready as best we can. As far as triggers go, certainly the governor's opening uh, up of relaxing of standards would uh, play heavily. I'm not sure how much the county 
requirements would, would affect our decisions. We are paying attention to what the town is allowing in terms of short-term visitors, thinking there may be some correlation between uh, a renter at a condo versus a, a visitor that we would have here. Primarily, we're trying to make sure that we're able to meet all the guidelines that uh, are coming our way. And as you all know, they're um, numerous. You got the CDC and the DHEC and OSHA and FDA and just in the CDC that as far as our business is concerned, there's all these different guidelines for business, community of faith, schools, restaurants, hotels, mass gatherings, parks, day camps, all those relate to activities that we have going on here. The one that hasn't been published yet, which is the most critical to our current decision-making process is the overnight camps that has not been released yet. And that's the one that would affect our most uh, pressing decision about whether to open up for summer camp. Uh, we've currently canceled our first two large camps and hope to open up back in June 22nd. That is fairly arbitrary at this point. And we have a couple of smaller groups starting on June 6th. If we can operate within the guidelines and keep everybody distanced properly, we're going to try to uh, um, manifest those. Um, of course, the, so back to the triggers, it's really just the standard of care that we're able to maintain because we just don't want to put anyone at risk. Does that answer your question, Scott? Yeah, I think so. Um, maybe just a little bit more conversation around you, you said that the town's uh, restriction on short-term rentals you know you're, you're sort of taking that as a cue i guess for um, how it might impact your guests coming to the camp um, i don't know if we want to have someone from the town respond to that was was that restriction intended to uh, cover the camp as well or or do you see that as a separate issue The town's regulation of short-term rentals, rentals is not, at this point, we have not made a determination. It, it ex, it, the current limitation expires on the 15th of May. There will be a ways and means meeting on the 12th of May and, and the expiration of that regulation of short-term rentals will be a topic for discussion at that ways and means meeting, but we have not made a determination about short-term rentals yet. I did see that uh, Kiowa has had in a meeting, I think yesterday, confirmed that they are going to allow their moratorium on short-term rent rentals to lapse on the 15th of May. I don't know what the other coastal communities have done or are doing at this point. We, we hear from them on the conference calls with Charleston County Emergency Management Department that we participate in three times a week. But I, I don't recall having heard from Isle of Palms or Sullivan's Island or Folly Beach the specific decisions that they have made about short-term rentals. Uh, Joe may, may better recall that than I do. Uh, the other thing is um, I don't, I can't say that I contemplated that our regulation of short-term rentals impacts the camp in particular. I. I guess my view of the camps activities was not as operating short-term rentals as they're defined in our order. So unless Joe thinks that that's not appropriate, uh, I would say whatever we do about short-term rent rentals uh, would not have a direct impact on what the camp does. 
could indirectly affect it only because once we have uh, allowed short-term rentals as they had been allowed in the past, uh, I, I suppose this becomes a more interesting destination for people. Okay. All right. Thank you for that clarification. Joe, did you have any further comments on that topic? Yeah, well, at last check, I believe Isle of Palms and um, <clears throat> Folly Beach are um, both scheduled to um, allow short-term rentals as of May 12th. Of course, all of this is um, subject to change. Uh, my reading on the uh, ordinance regarding short-term rentals, um, we define it to apply to any dwelling unit or property that's rented or offered for rent to any individual or group for temporary occupancy for a period not to exceed um, 28 days. So I, I would think that the camp would be uh, included in that definition. Okay. Uh, Ned, any further questions from you on that point? Um, well, it sounds like it might be moot in the sense that our opening date, at least as we're projecting it, is is almost a month after that is expected to expire anyway. So we, it's, it's not that we're going to ignore it. It's just that we're it's it's one of the things we're monitoring. So so thank you for that chance. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Any other questions for the camp? All right. Well, let's move on. Do we have anyone uh, on the call from the marina? Okay. How about the uh, Merchants Association or any of the other businesses around town? Would you right. like uh, would um, you like Seabrook Island Utility? Yes, yeah, sure. Thank you. <laughs> and we're really quite a bit different in some ways. Um, our focus has been not so much uh, open and closing to the public because generally speaking, in many ways, we are uh, very public limited. In order to come to our operations, our plant, one has to come through a locked gate. Um, so, and, and rarely does the public do that. I mean, I think they access us almost, uh, fairly consistently through telephone calls. Um, so we're, we're different from that perspective. So we didn't close to the public because we virtually really were never, um, directly open to the public or generally not open to the public. Yes, people do come, but uh, again, they, they have to um, get through a locked gate. They have to call in. They have to, uh, you know, we have to allow them sort of access. Our concern really has much more been along the lines of keeping our staff safe. Uh, unlike some entities where the staff were sent home or they're not working at their location, we do not have that. Uh, ability. We are an essential business. You obviously want your water and you certainly want uh, your sewer appropriately taken care of. So as an essential business, uh, our staff really don't have the luxury of working from generally working from home. We need to be able to operate out of our plant. What our concerns really have been have focused on is the safety of the staff. How can we keep us safe uh, from each other. Um, should someone come in, uh, one of the staff persons who might have come in um, and brought the virus in. So a lot of our concerns have been what we've put into place have really been more along the lines of what things can we do to keep uh, our staff safe from, from one another. Um, everything from wiping down door handles of and steering wheels of trucks or assigning specific trucks to only specific 
you know, a single person when we have that opportunity, that kind of thing. Um, but we, we've had to continue to maintain our operations. So we are in fact quite a bit different. I don't think we're going to be necessarily relaxing at all at this time, what we're doing um, as far as our safety and our precautions, our measures that we're taking for one another, because obviously we need to continue to be safe to be able to run our business. Um, so we're, we're, we're a bit different, but that's about what the uh, Seabrook Island utility is, is up to in relationship to this particular uh, emergency situation. Questions? Okay. Yeah, thank you for that update. Any questions from anyone? If I, if I can ask one question, I saw an article um, online yesterday that um, a lot of utilities are seeing impacts to their um, revenues. Uh, I know the article was dealing primarily with electric utilities. Um, is the Utility Commission seeing any impact at this time? No, we, we have been asked, you know, our concern in regard to that, Joe, has really somewhat been our, um, our folks up at Freshfields uh, and providing uh, sewer and water, but mostly sewer up at Freshfields. Um, and we did receive a request from one of the entities up there, would we consider um, reducing our rate or you know, modifying or, or what have you? Uh, and we did respond to that. Um, and basically our response was, is that we would look at, we, we could look at that, but in order to look at that single entity, we really need a sense of uh, what is the overall picture? You know, are we getting many, many uh, entities or folks coming to us and saying to us, please reduce our our cost of our sewer or, you know, what have you. So, um, you know, to, to address one individual or entity, we really felt the need that we needed to have a bigger picture. Uh, and so that's primarily what we're doing. As of right now, I'm not hearing, uh, and I would be hearing um, from our, our manager that we're getting a lot more requests. The, the one impact or request that we did have was the governor had made a recommendation to the utilities that they not shut off uh, particular utilities if uh, individuals failed to pay, pay their bills. And that included, you know, we, we took that and we addressed it. And in fact, we did put something, I put something out on timelines that basically said that, um, you know, we would not at this point, per this time, shut anyone actually off. However, the penalties and fees that an individual would get for failure to pay uh, are still continuing, um, but we would in fact not shut anyone down at this time. Um, and, and so, you know, that's how we've dealt with that. We, we periodically get people that fail to pay. And by and large, the feeling was in looking at the individuals that had failed to pay, they're not failing, at least as best as we can tell, they're not failing to pay because of COVID-19 and the circumstances of not being, um, earning their, their livelihood. Um, they're not, they're failing to pay because maybe they're not coming down here and picking up their bills uh, because they're away. And so, you know, part of what we had said was, is, you know, you can pull your bills online if you're not, you know, physically down here and getting your mail forwarding or, or what have you. It, again, generally those that are not paying, they're, they oftentimes are repeated customers that have failed to pay many, many times, way before COVID-19 even came into an existence. So, you know, we, we've, we've been looking at the issue, but um, that's the impact so far that we've had in relationship to this. Um, I think how much financially 
an impact we might have. We may not realize until a little bit down the line when uh, people are not paying their bills on time, uh, if you know, as that come to be. But so far, we seem to be pretty, pretty good. Okay, thank you for that clarification or that answer. Um, any other questions for the utility? All right, let's move on to um, any other entities. Uh, I'm not familiar with who else might be on the call. So any other entities um, have a report that has spoken yet? All right, very good. Well, then let's go ahead and continue to move through our agenda here. So I think we've already talked about the phases for reopening here. Um, and I sort of, you know, when I wrote this agenda, I contemplated, you know, possibly uh, focusing more on outdoor activities first um, and then limited inside and then full inside activities. But I think you all have obviously done a, a great job um, you know, developing your phases as appropriate. So I don't think we need to talk about that any further. Uh, so let's move on here to what other considerations should be given uh, towards reopening. Um, we've talked about the uh, coordination with other governmental guidance and the coordination with the town. Um, and I think to, to some extent, we've talked about the need to protect the staff and monitor the staff. What about vendors and supplies and, and other resources? Um, are you all seeing any constraints there or any um, possible concerns about uh, really the supply chain and how that may impact your ability to continue operations? I'll speak for the club. Um, yes, we, we are. Um, obviously things like, um, you know, we're, we're trying to order as many gloves and masks as we can. So far that seems to be okay. Um, little things like, you know, stanchions for hand sanitizing stations, those sorts of things. Those are very difficult to, to come by. Um, so we're, you know, I think with some of the restrict, some of the recommendations and requirements, all the, all the, um, hospitality services out there, we're, we're all kind of fighting for the same, same supply. So that, that's a challenge. Um, the biggest concern we have right now is really with food. Um, uh, beef and chicken is, is going to be an issue. Um, a week ago, Chef and I were thinking it was going to be a burgerless summer at the nest. Um, we think that we'll be okay, but um, that that <clears throat> excuse me that is an issue. So we are seeing some things with food, primarily meat. Seafood produce seems to be fine so far, but uh, meat, particularly beef and chicken, um, we're we're a little worried. We're we're not panicked. But uh, there's going to be, we predict there's going to be some serious price fluctuations that we're going to experience. And we're going to have to be very fluid with, with our menus and our offerings this, um, this summer. So though, right now, those are our main concerns is just, you know, obviously hand sanitizer, hand sanitizing stations, masks. Again, right now, it looks like we can get most of, the, most of that stuff. Some things are on back order. Uh, but I would say most of the conversation this past week with Randy and myself has been about um, food, primarily beef and chicken. So we'll see how it goes. But that's, um, that's what we're most concerned about right now. Thank you, Caleb. Any other similar concerns or questions? Hey, Scott, this is Ned from the camp. We, we, uh, one of our things that we're foreseeing is that we're going to need to test kids before they come and participate. And one of those tests is the thermometers, the infrared, no touch thermometers. And we're, we're not seeing any of those available except for from China. And those are the ones that are suspect. So if anyone knows a good supply station for those, we'd be very interested to hear about it. Okay. Any thoughts there from anyone else? Okay. Yeah, I understand, you know, just like all the other PPE type of supplies and equipment, you know, those items are just on such high demand and short supply, uh, especially when you take China out of the equation. Uh, hopefully, Ned, by you still got some time in the June, hopefully some things will open up over the next couple of weeks. 
I like your optimism. Thank you. <laughs> Absolutely. We're, we're running right, into, any other thoughts or questions about supplies? No, we're running into the same issue with things like hand sanitizer and uh, cleaning supplies. And um, we, actually, there, there are a few companies that are producing some alcohol-based sanitizer here. Uh, we just went and uh, bought some a few days ago at a plantation. Pharmacy, the compound pharmacy, um, and we were able to replenish our um, our supplies there. Um, we had also looked at the uh, uh, Firefly Distillery in North Charleston. I believe they're uh, producing some in house too, and, and I'm sure there's some others around the area um, because you're not going to be able to. Uh, uh, walk into a grocery store right now and find Purell or, or anything like that. So we, we've just been looking to some other um, local sources and um, find if that's something you're looking for, I'd recommend maybe uh, reaching out to some of those uh, uh, local suppliers. I think we got that all, Joe. You were breaking up a bit while you were talking, but I think we uh, got the the basic gist of what you were saying. Um, I guess my question to the group is, uh, you know, is there, you know, much like after a hurricane when supplies and resources are in short demand, is there um, any need or benefit to, uh, you know, all the entities sort of working together on trying to coordinate supply acquisition at this point? No, it doesn't sound like anyone's uh, ready to take up that topic. So that's okay. Let's you know, keep that in the back of your mind of, of whether, and I don't know if in your calls with the county, uh, Joe, or anyone else from the town council, um, if the, the county has been talking about, you know, resource requests and, and trying to assist municipalities and, um, you know, locating and acquiring different PPE type of supplies. Have you, have you heard that from the county at all? Oh. They, they have reported on the calls, different agencies have reported on the calls that they have been dealing with shortages. There's been no indication during the calls that there are many general efforts to try to coordinate the acquisition of PPE. I think the, uh, it seems to me that this is a topic that comes up from at least uh, SCD hack. Uh, they're working on, they have been working on uh, heavy PPE that they would need. And I think that was also true of uh, Charleston County EMD, but I don't know that they're continuing to I, early on in the calls, they were accessing what had been part of the national stockpile. And those, I think, deliveries have already been accessed and distributed. And I don't know that there's an ongoing shortage being reported during the call. Okay. Well, yeah, my only question was if, if at some point the town is able to um, you know, get access to some uh, maybe restricted supply of PPE. Um, you know, maybe the town needs to keep it for itself, but if the town's able to get more than it needs, uh, whether there'd be a desire to um, cost share or, you know, share supplies with other entities sort of in the interest of public safety, um, you know, understand there's all sorts of costs and other logistics to work out there. Yeah, I would say, Scott, we're in the process of, uh, you know, adding, we, we, we always have gloves because uh, for the kitchen, but uh, we, we've added masks to our kind of ongoing dry goods uh, purchasing. Um, right now, those seem to be okay. I'll just throw it out there. We're not trying to hoard, but maybe we are trying to hoard at the same time when it comes to, to, to certain things. So um, 
I would just invite, you know, uh, anyone that if, if you are short of supplies, you know, town, town camp, POA, feel free to shoot me an email. And if we have extra or if we're not having any issues um, getting these things, you can kind of have have what, what we have in stock and then we'll just kind of replenish accordingly. So I'll just say as far as coordinating may be tough, but I'll but if you find yourself in a, in a tight spot, um, feel free to reach out to me and, and we'll do whatever we can to help. Yeah, that, that's great. Thank you so much, Caleb. Okay, let's move on then. Um, next topic on the agenda, I think is uh, an important one for us all to consider. Um, you know, how do we, once we start reopening, whether it's phase one, phase two, or phase three, um, how, how do we monitor how effective we are and, and making sure that we're, you know, not creating more of a problem by, you know, seeing a, a spike in the number of people, whether it be staff or visitors or whoever, um, sick or, or creating problems? Um, you know, and it's not really just illness, right? It's, it's the number of people and and all sorts, you know, availability of supplies and so forth. So what do you all think the appropriate metrics would be and, and how do we share those metrics with each other to make sure that we're coordinating um, our monitoring of, of our activities throughout these different phases? This is a, a difficulty for me <clears throat> because of the, as I've said a couple of times now, the, our, our lack of wherewithal and resources to be able to monitor things we'd all like to do. Um, we have no way of uh, seeing what the increase in the number of cases might be after, pick a date, doesn't make any difference. The increase in the number of whatever, we just don't have the metrics that are coming down to the Seabrook Island level, even uh, Seabrook Island Kiwa level. point out that uh, we were informed early on in the calls with the county that if there were a positive case within a municipality, the municipality would be informed. To date, we have not been informed of the occurrence of a positive case within the town of Seabrook Island. So to the extent that we can rely on having been told that we would be informed, I would say that so far as the town knows, there are no positive cases within the town of Seabrook Island. The data that we get is primarily sourced by South Carolina DHEC. They do countywide and zip code reporting. The zip code reporting includes reporting for 29455. That does not tell you anything other than within that zip code, there are a certain number of cases which have been confirmed positive. Confirmed positive means that there was a test for the presence of the virus and it was found in someone who was tested. I think the most recent number of confirmed positive cases in the 29455 zip code is 16. So out of all of that, all of the geographic area that falls within the 29455 zip code, uh, I think the, the number of confirmed positive cases was 16, not, not a big number. But we are not aware, at least the town is not aware of there having been any confirmed positive cases in the town of Seabrook Island. We also need to be aware that the town does not undertake, we do not have the facilities or the resources to undertake testing. There has been a recent rollout by the Charleston County working with Fetter Health to have uh, Testing, you can have screening and testing at locations uh, around the county. And I'm not sure if I have the date right, but I think the 12th of May, there will be a, a uh, screening and testing being done at the Johns Island Library. So anyone who 
wants to be screened and tested cannot get tests without being screened first. Based on the screening, there'll be a referral for a test. But if you want to have, if you want to go through that, you can go to the Island uh, Public Library. And I'm I'm very confident that the uh, the date of that test has been uh, of that event at the Johns Island Public Library has been published on Tidelines. Okay. Thank you, sir. Um, I guess one of the thoughts I had here was um, you know, maybe for the POA to talk about, uh, I'm sure you all are monitoring the number of people coming through the gate on a daily basis. Um, is that information maybe that should be shared, uh, not necessarily daily, but just as you see the number of uh, people coming through the gate, you know, escalate or hit different triggers. Uh, you probably all know kind of what the normal is, right, for different times of year. Um, would that help us all to kind of understand, you know, just in general, how things are changing on the island with the number of people here and how that might inform us as to, you know, to increase our vigilance for monitoring and maintaining social distance within all of our various public places? Uh, <clears throat> just to that uh, issue, since for at least the last month or so, we've been now, we've been monitoring the guest uh, passes that come through, which in the month of April has dramatically decreased as compared to April of a year ago. Okay. Uh, April is always a popular month here. And uh, guests, and in fact, once the um, emergency came in in the middle of March. Guest passes and guests through the gate drop, dropped dramatically. Um, when people say that we have a large group of people, it is a reflection of property owners coming down to access their property. They may usually rent it. They may usually not come down in April because kids are still in school. For various reasons, they have, they are property owners. They are come through the property owner lane or if they come through the guest lane, uh, they are treated obviously as property owners. And it could be also their families invited guests. So the number of true guests have dropped dramatically. And that is reflected in the, um, that was reflected until the short-term rental uh, went in, it was reflected by data from the rental agencies. They had cancellations uh, all over the place. One of the other things is people were saying that the beaches are somewhat overcrowded, especially on weekends. When there are no amenities open, such as the beach club for uh, at the club's properties or the lake house pools or even the lake house facility, everything is closed. Basically, the only thing that's opened is the beach. And so therefore, people are taking advantage of that in this, you know, nice weather we've been having. So yes, and uh, I know the town has been with their beach patrol enforcing social distancing rules with that. We put a process into place where we have shared uh, anything that has come up uh, through our data analysis of guest passes. Heather has done an outstanding job. She does it uh, a couple of times a week. Our um, um, person with the security, um, Patrick, was Patrick was on here, I think, a minute ago. Maybe he left. Yeah, I'm still on here. Oh, yeah, there you are, Patrick. How you doing? Good, yeah, how are you? Hey, maybe you could tell some of the things that you've been, Patrick, and this is the first time Patrick and I have had a chance to meet. So uh, it's, uh, it's nice to finally uh, get a chance um, to talk with you. Maybe you can uh, speak to some of the things that your group looks for in the data as they go through the gate? 
Um, I'd say really the only thing risk wise um, going forward, and you kind of touched on this with the nice weather we've been having. Um, there's definitely a, an uptick of uh, people calling in visitors um, and us issuing visitor passes over over the weekend. A lot of people going to the beach, um, and we did get some calls about kind of some crowds out on the beach, but the, you know, the beach patrol kind of uh, squashed all that and upheld the social distancing. Um, other than that, it's been it's been a little slower with contractors. Uh, they're still coming in. Um, and I'd say about the same as it has been through this whole situation we've gone uh, concerning property owners. Okay. Anything else, Scott, that you can think of that you'd like to have a us answer? Yeah, I guess I'm just wondering if um, if the other entities in the town, you know, think there would be any benefit. I mean, I don't even know if, if Sapo would be willing to do this or not. So I'm just throwing it out as an idea um, of, of just providing, you know, through email to the DRC or something like that, you know, periodic updates to say, hey, you know, we just hit whatever the benchmarks are, a thousand guest passes or, you know, 500 or whatever, the, like I said, whatever the different benchmarks might be that would make sense just to give everyone kind of a, a clue as to how the, the population of the island is changing over time as we go through these different phases. Would Sapo be willing to do that? Would there be benefit that you all think the other entities uh, in receiving that information? What I'll do is I'll take this up with Heather. I don't see why not. And anything we'll um, share it with Skip as far as, as the chairperson of this group. And then we'll go from there he can disseminate it as he sees fit. So I know we've been sharing, Heather's been sharing some things with Joe regarding, you know, possible enforcement issues. We worked that out a while ago. And, uh, you know, the town has been using some of the data already. Like I said earlier, we've been talking with the town about this and identifying uh, possible short-term rental ban um, you know, violations. Uh, Heather makes Joe aware of that and the process continues that their code enforcement people then go out and investigate it, which would be the normal process that we had worked out. So yeah, we'll continue to share. That's not a problem. Yeah. If I can, Scott, I just wanted to take a second to uh, to thank Dan and Heather uh, and Patrick for their assistance. Um, they're providing us regular information uh, on um, folks coming through the gate, uh, including um, uh, potential um, rental property violations. Um, we have been using that information and actively um, going and investigating um, those uh, those potential violations. Um, and then also when we get um, calls from uh, residents uh, who are concerned um, about what may be going on um, near them, uh, we've been able to get uh, from the POA as well uh, and use that as part of the investigation. That's been um, hugely beneficial for us uh, as we've um, that we've been uh, enforcing the uh, emergency ordinance, and I just wanted to uh, take a second to uh, uh, thank all of you uh, for your assistance with that. No problem. Uh, Heather, have you been hearing some of this or? Yeah, I, I have. Is there anything that um, you would like to add to what was said? No, we could, I'm happy to get the statistics if they need them. We keep track all summer. I have to go on mute because my printer's running. I'll be back. Okay. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> multitasking. You know, one yeah, thing, absolutely. Scott, one thing I'd like to ask um, Steve, um, who's uh, head of the uh, CERT team, has CERT been involved in any way during this emergency? Do you see a way that CERT could have been? or whatever, where this is simply not something that's in your wheelhouse? 
I'd just like to hear from him with regards to that. Uh, <clears throat> thanks, Dan. Actually, we, we have not. Uh, at, the, at the beginning of this crisis, we, we did go to our trailer and, and we've been doing an assessment to bring all our medical supplies up to date. And what we realize is we do not have any of the, any of the gear, the PPEs that, that are necessary to, to do anything in this uh, environment. And once everything calms down, we will uh, be stocking our trailer with uh, N95 masks with uh, and other, other gear that's, that's necessary, the, the appropriate gloves. We do have gloves, but not really the best for medical use. Um, so we have, not, number one, we have not been called upon anybody to help. Uh, we have not had a need and we have not, to be honest, had the ability because of our lack of PPEs. All right. Thanks, Steve. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. So the other topic I wanted to address within uh, monitoring here is, is really an important one about how do we communicate if we identify that a, a staff member or someone else um, sort of within our um, you know, within our entity uh, has, you know, tested positive, right? And, you know, that kind of information can go wild through social media and everything else. But it's important that we have, you know, some fact-based system in place to, to share that information. So just an ex a hypothetical example, uh, Ned, if, if one of your staff members at the camp or uh, one of the visitors, you know, either presently or later, you know, confirms they, they were tested positive, um, should we share that information with the other entities so at least we have some facts in, in the face of all the rumors that may start flying around? Um, and same obviously goes with all the other entities if they find, um, you know, positive cases within their staff or visitors. Total, totally agree with that. And uh, in all the literature I've been reading, the South Carolina DHEC is asking to be notified in the same way. So it makes sense to let our neighbors know that. So if there's some kind of bulletin board or posting site where we can all refer to it or all post and, and load stuff up to it as, as we get a positive case identified, we'd be uh, glad to do that and grateful for it. Yeah, thanks, Ned. So again, just a hypothetical there, but what, what do the rest of you think from the other entities? Do you think that would be uh, helpful and are you willing to participate in sharing that kind of information? Obviously, you know, it would be all anonymous, not identifying who it was or any details, but just the fact that we had a positive case and maybe the date or whatever. Uh, just, we've talked about this several times and in consultation with uh, our attorneys and all that with regards to what public records are we allowed to share uh, as far as personal records, excuse me, not public, personal, re personal information about people without them giving permission to share it. Um, Heather and I have been participating in quite a few webinars from around the state from homeowners associations. And the, I would say, and I'll let Heather speak later, but my take from that is the right answer, there's no right answer. Some of the attorneys who say is share the information. Some of the attorneys say, absent a release from a person, you're not allowed to share it. So, I guess it just depends on what attorney you have that day. My apologies to any attorney uh, listening in here. Um, but uh, depending upon the attorney you get that day is the advice that you get. Heather, is there anything you wanted to add to that? I mean, am I wrong? Uh, with no, that's, that's what they were saying. So um, I could see us maybe sh sharing amongst ourselves, but uh, I would be very careful, especially if the person wants to remain anonymous, if we find out about it or whatever. Uh, that's, you know, I would consult your 
legal uh, people with regards to that before doing anything. So. Yeah, I wouldn't advocate at all sharing, you know, personal information, right? But I'm talking more just generally that, you know, the POA staff is, is confirming that we had one staff member, you know, test positive, just something general like that. Is that is that the context in which there was disagreement, whether that was allowed or or were they talking more about sharing, you know, more personal details? It was more sharing if a case comes up in the associate, you know, wherever the association would be. So if somebody tests positive for it, what is our the context of the discussion was what is our responsibility as a homeowners association to share that information with a the rest of the association um, uh, or other entities or whatever. Um, so it, it was very, very interesting. Yeah. Um, Scott, I would say we, um, uh, Kiwa Island Club had had this happen to them early on uh, in this and um, we were able to get a hold of the email that they sent to their membership and I, I they handled it really well. Um, we've been blessed so far to so not <laughs> have had to do this but we've had a lot of conversations about if this were to happen how would we handle it. Um, we, we, we would probably uh, communicate this to the membership. Uh, you know, probably um, simply state that, you know, we've had a, uh, uh, someone test positive um, and, and list what we've done to, to do what we can to prevent the spread accordingly as far as um, informing, quarantining those individuals that have come into contact with this person based upon the parameters, you know, that the CDC has said, you know, if you spend more than X number of minutes with them and, and, and that sort of thing. So um, I would lean toward we probably would communicate something just to let people know that we recognize that there, that there is uh, that there that there is a case um, and what we have done to, you know, to to try to box it in to the best of our abilities and just and just hope that it it wasn't in an area that would um, dramatically, um, obviously, first and foremost, impact a lot of people's health, um, uh, but also that wouldn't that would not dramatically impact the operation or any services to the to the um, members. But um, I, I would I would think we would we would communicate something that would that would most likely be the avenue that we would take. Obviously, not use anyone's name or not describe it in any fashion where you could quickly narrow narrow down who, who it could be. So we'd be careful with that. Yeah, one of the things right. that we would probably look at is if let's say one of our workers in the lake house came down with something, we would probably go and try to, as they're saying, contact trace, you had some sort of uh, contact with this person. I don't know how far we would be able to go, but I'm sure some health organization would would be able to do that or whatever. I mean, we're look, we were looking at a couple of different things. One being, as uh, Caleb just mentioned, uh, a worker, but then there is also the issue of a community member. So and I think both of those are, are two different types of situations. My recollection yeah, is so we were informed early on that employers would be informed if one of their employees had a confirmed positive test. And the employer uh, would then be, I, I would speculate, involved in the contact tracing. So in other words, if a staff member of the club or a staff member of the POA is a confirmed positive, then I, what I would expect to happen is that the club or the POA, whoever was the employer, would then be involved in the contact tracing that would be undertaken 
by the health services. So to the extent that SCDHEC does contract contact tracing, I would expect the employer to be involved in that contact tracing. I, I don't know how either the club or the POA would become aware of a confirmed positive of a member. Uh, I don't question that it's, I'm not saying that it, it couldn't happen if, if the club or the POA were aware of it. It seems to me that you would be well advised to uh, consult with counsel before you start releasing any information that you happen to uh, receive because it's entirely the private information of the individual who was confirmed as positive and unless you have a, re a release from that person I, I don't think that you are in a position to be able to release that information even though you have it. Yeah, there's, there's certainly some legal issues and, and we can leave it up to each entity to navigate those on their own. Uh, and, and I suppose those legal issues would certainly apply to what I'm suggesting, which is you know just sharing internally amongst the entities. Um, but if you all get any clarity on that, I, you know, the legal issues aside, I do see benefit to um, at least the DRC members sharing with each other any knowledge of positive cases, because in the absence of those facts, um, you know, we're all sort of relying on social media news reports and so forth, which we really have no basis to <laughs> determine if they're factual or not, other than you know, if it comes from DHEC or some official source, which you know, may happen quickly or may take a while before if and when they report it. Hey, Scott. So, any, any other thoughts there before we move on? Yeah. Oh, Scott, this, I know where some people need to jump off at 11. We're getting closer to that. I don't know how, Skip, how long you want to take this. Anyway, um, my question is this, and we don't have to answer it today. But one of the things that is rapidly approaching on June 1st is hurricane season. And we start talking about evacuations and what to do and so on. And that's been a major, um, you know, focus of this group for as long as I've been on it for the past couple of years. Uh, the question is, what does an evacuation look like in the era of uh, the coronavirus. In other words, what should, I mean, obviously, you know, you're not going to wait around and say, oh, I can't go out because of that. And the hurricane comes and blows your house away. I mean, I understand that. But on the flip side of that, what should we be looking at as information that this group can share with the community that says, when you're planning your evacuation or whatever, try to do this first and so on. And, you know, I'm, I'm reading about how some hotels are opening or will be opening and, you know, they might not be able to uh, accommodate as many people as they once did, all these types of things. So I'm not saying we need to do that today, but maybe, you know, as much as, since you're the expert in the field here, Scott, uh, any information about this that you can share with us? Um, because I plan on uh, doing something on June 1st with uh, uh, a message just to get uh, out to the property owners. And I'd like to mention something about, you know, this season coming up. Yeah, that's a good point, Dan. And, um, you know, that's, that's probably another discussion for another day for sure about how hurricane, you know, uh, could really complicate things if we're still under this pandemic. But um, for now, I would say the best recommendation that I have is to um, recommend that people identify, you know, friends and family members to stay with first if they're evacuating um, and not to depend on hotels. 
you know, think long and hard about where you could go and um, who you could stay with that you know personally um, in, you know, safe areas, whether that's, you know, in the upstate or in other states, um, and then make hotels, you know, your, really your option of last resort, uh, because there are a lot of unknowns about whether hotels will be able to accommodate as they have in the past or, or not. Um, and, of course, shelters are, you know, I think completely uh, – out of the question at this point, at least uh, for people of means um, from a place like Seabrook. So I, I don't know what shelter operations are going to look like. Um, that's going to be a, a, another complicated issue, but I don't want people to think that shelters are should be considered um, because there's just so many unknowns there. So that's the best advice I have right now, but I'm monitoring FEMA closely for any advice that they might be providing uh, as we get closer to June 1st. And I'll share that as I, if and when I receive it. Um, let's go ahead and move on then and uh, talk about the, the last item on the agenda, which is how do we prepare for the next wave? And, and Steve um, brought up some of these issues earlier today. Um, just generally, uh, as, as you all have talked about your different phases and so forth for reopening, have you considered um, what the what the phases might be in the reverse direction, you know, how we go from phase one, two, or three back down to, you know, lockdown again. Um, and if so, are there any thoughts or considerations that you think we need to discuss together? Um, yeah, Scott, we, we've, uh, the club has, um, uh, we've looked at that basically taking our current phase plan on how to reopen. And like you said, just simply reversing it. Um, I've kind of gone back to research some of the email blasts that we did just to refresh my memory on the exact order of how we closed things and how we restricted things starting around March 15 or 16, something like that. Um, and, um, yeah, I think it's just a, a matter of, um, like you said, just having the same kind of phased approach that we've established now for reopening, just flip it. Um, and again, just kind of following whatever the, most likely I would say following whatever the governor um, and, and, the, and the governmental entities recommend, if not, you know, maybe acting a little faster, if that's what the community wants. Um, um, but certainly no slower than, than what the government would want. So, um, yeah, we are looking at that, um, and that's something that we're that we're working on now, just in case there is a, a, a resurgence of this in the future. Right. Yeah. So I'd encourage y'all to think about. I mean, I, I agree with that comment exactly, um, Caleb. You know, no slower than what the governor um, prescribes or, or requires. But um, as we saw coming into um, this current you know, phase of the pandemic, um, you know, the governor did, uh, you know, sort of take his time in, in providing that lockdown order. So, um, and I think many of you probably started shutting down, uh, you know, possibly before then. So, you know, just think about what those uh, internal triggers might be, um, you know, if you were waiting for the governor to give an order, but yet it, it just seems like uh, we need to take action in advance, um, you know, it might be, worthwhile to think about what those internal triggers should be to start shutting things down and go in a reverse direction. So any other thoughts there? Okay. All right. Um, how can the town best communicate the current status? Do we have, I'm sorry, go ahead. One of the first things we did was declare a state of emergency for the town, which at least in, in terms of the town's ordinances provides the mayor some uh, authority that's uh, you would, I would describe as extraordinary. And so the mayor is then empowered to issue orders that would have uh, the force of law within the town. Uh, there, there are certain I'll say questions about uh, the strength of that authorization under the town's ordinances, but nevertheless, uh, we did proceed 
with a declaration of a state of emergency. And one of the first orders that uh, came from me was uh, directed to social distancing. So we prohibited gatherings of more than 10 people and required that gatherings or groups of 10 or fewer would practice social distancing. There is no, uh, I'm not thinking of getting ahead of the governor, but uh, at this point, we're not thinking about uh, lifting the state of emergency in the town. The circumstances wouldn't merit it at present. And, it, and as we look at the projections going forward, they're, they're looking at projecting the number of deaths per day out into August. So it isn't as if you could say we're within a couple of weeks of lifting a state of emergency within the town. That's just not in the cards at this point. So the notion of what about a second wave, we're not finished with the first wave. So it's kind of hard to get ahead of where the governor would be in terms of a second wave when we haven't finished with the first wave. Yeah, I understand that. I'm, I'm just trying to look ahead into the future here and say at some point, you know, we're going to get back to some semblance of normal, right? Phase three and, and the terminology that you all have used. And um, that's quite possible that whether it's in the fall, winter, or sometime next year, that we do have a, another wave. And, you know, the question is, do we wait for the governor to um, reenact some of the uh, orders that are currently in place, or do we you know, uh, preempt that and and take matters into our own hands to start shutting down operations and other things. So I, I don't know that that's necessarily a, a long discussion we have to have now, but certainly something I think each entity needs to consider. Um, again, I was just pointing out the other item here, um, and Mary, you mentioned the uh, state of emergency order. Uh, do, we have a good process in place. I know through hurricanes, other things we've been through, it seems like we have a pretty good communications process. Is that working uh, equally well for this pandemic in terms of communicating orders from the town and, and other entities out to the public? I would say that it's been working satisfactorily. We've, we've issued, I think we're up to number 17 of our public information statements uh, the public information state, we use the channels of the local blog timelines. We use our uh, Twitter feed. We use our Facebook uh, account. We also put the uh, public information statements up on our website. If you go to our website, the home page of the website reflects a special coloring that indicates something is different as far as the town is concerned. So all of these indicators are in place and the channels for communication are in place. I'm, I believe, I haven't really been tracking it closely, but I believe that SAPOA has been copying over our public information statements and disseminating those to the property owners. That's correct. That's what they usually do anyway. So yeah, that's, that's what we've been doing. Yeah. So whatever we might miss, Scott, through, as I said, our, our uh, Twitter feed or Facebook page or our website, we still have the benefit of the email distribution that SAPOA has, has traditionally done for our statements. Yeah, I would add we had uh, Tidelines too. They've been running all of our um, public information statements. Um, <clears throat> I would say the only hiccup that we've had so far would be um, uh, we have really good contact information for all of our uh, rental management companies. Um, you know, the Postal Getaway, Seabrook Exclusives, Pam Harrington, you know, whoever. Uh, or managing um, uh, large blocks of, um, of rental units. Um, 
<clears throat> we've had a bit of an issue um, getting uh, reliable contact information um, where we can send out rapid uh, notifications to the um, the individual owners uh, who have one unit or one or two units. Um, and uh, <clears throat> so we know a lot of them have been getting the information through uh, the public information statements, whether it's the website, social media, DOA, or timelines. Um, we were actually going through, uh, and for a lot of them, we, we didn't even have an email address. So when we send out the notices, we have a, um, a pretty extensive mailing list, and we have all the main uh, rental management companies, but we uh, did not have email addresses for uh, a lot of the, the smaller um, owner managed um, units. So uh, for those, some of them, we had to uh, contact them individually um, by phone. Um, and then for some of them, we, um, uh, we had our administrative assistant uh, was actually going through because we were checking to see um, when units were being offered for rent on some of the major um, rental, uh, rental platforms um, where she was actually going and pulling up the uh, individual uh, advertisement and contacting them through Airbnb or um, through uh, uh, VRBO or home away or whatever. Um, so going forward next year, that's something we definitely want to make a priority uh, is to make sure that we're getting um, reliable uh, contact information, preferably email uh, for all of the, um, uh, anyone who has a um, licensed rental property uh, that would certainly make it easier to uh, uh, distribute the information when we have something like a, a temporary restriction on short rentals to make sure we're hitting everybody with that information uh, very uh, as efficiently as possible. Excellent. Thank you, Joe. And thank you, uh, Mayor. So it, it sounds like we're in pretty good shape for uh, communications. Again, um, I think we've done a great job with that for from past events as well. So glad to hear that's all continuing. Um, other considerations or thoughts? Uh, for preparing for the, for whenever the next wave uh, may occur. Just kind of one one thought from me. <clears throat> the one thing that we will have if there is a next wave that we didn't have with this wave is experience. So at least we will have a uh, based on experience a frame of reference uh, to apply to the actions that come out wherever they come out, but probably from the, from the governor's office and on down to be able to react more quickly than we might have done before. And that's just not us, but everybody in this in this situation. Yeah, yep, good point. Okay. Um, what other thoughts do you all have? Uh, I've covered everything that was on my agenda. Do you all have other questions or thoughts um, you know we didn't get too much into the short-term rental issue I think we took touched on some important parts um, but are there any other final thoughts that you all have um, before we start to wrap up okay all right well in terms of action items then um, I didn't capture too many from our discussion I, I think the the main one was, uh, you know, just up here a few minutes ago, where we talked about, you know, um, you know, discussing with your legal counsel all the issues and maybe a recommendation for how you would share information about a, a positive case with your constituents um, and, and even with each other. So uh, that's probably an important action item. And then also to think about the triggers. You all have uh, done a great job of coming up with the phases for reopening, but also thinking about what those triggers and, and closing phases might be um, if, if we have to go back into lockdown or into a phased uh, approach back to lockdown. Um, in terms of our next meeting topics and potential dates, I, I do think there's a need for us to spend more time talking about hurricane season and how a hurricane can be much more challenging um, in the midst of this pandemic. <clears throat> so whether that's you know another meeting like this or a, a tabletop exercise virtually or otherwise, um, I do think that's probably the next thing that we need to 
discuss and plan. Um, does anyone from the, the town have any thoughts there about trying to coordinate that with the DRC? Okay, well, let's leave it open now, but uh, Skip, maybe you and I can talk about some ideas I have there. But again, I do think it would be important for the Disaster Recovery Council to work together towards um, you know, identifying how our hurricane plan might need to be modified or updated a bit um, in the context of this pandemic. Okay. All right. Very good. Well, I don't have anything else, Skip. Uh, if you have anything you want to give closing thoughts or anything before we adjourn. I, I would close as, uh, as I open by thanking everybody for giving me your time and, and uh, your ideas as we uh, have struggled through this, this thing that uh, is, is new to all of us. Scott was just talking about uh, getting ready for hurricanes. This pandemic is the hurricane that doesn't go away, apparently. Uh, so uh, <clears throat> let's hope we don't have too many things compounding what we're doing. Uh, but I do thank you. And I would like to hear from folks uh, as to what you thought about the format of this meeting. <clears throat> now we might uh, do a little better job if we're going to continue with virtual meetings uh, and all those things to help us be more effective. Other than that, Scott, that's it. Okay. All right. Well, uh, if no one has anything else, then I, I don't know if I can adjourn or if that has to be someone from town <laughs> to officially adjourn us. Well, Joe, I guess I think that's something that uh, I should do as convening the meeting. So I think we can just declare that we're adjourned. Thank you, everyone. Very good. Thank you all. I'll, I'll, I'll provide some notes and send them out um, within the next week. Great. Thanks. Thanks. Goodbye. Thanks. Thanks. Goodbye, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you.